And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This interview is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, creators of the next generation firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud. Engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. And by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Awesome, but for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. And now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer or perhaps an old-fashioned, <clears throat> give the intern control of your botnet. Here is your host, a man who couldn't Get his mini to start, and that's not a euphemism. I did. Oh, you got your mini started finally. I jumped my wife in the, in the you, you, jump, you, you had to jump your wife to get your mini started. Yes. So, exactly what I did. <laughs> outstanding, Mr. Paul Esidorian. Well, welcome, everyone. This is the Jumper Cable episode. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for the late start and the awful camera angles. They, and <laughs> my fault, I moved And the, the horrible euphemisms and, and, uh, and the non-euphemisms. It's, it's just, let's just let's just apologize guests. in yeah. advance, except for, mis for Mr. Secret <laughs> Guest, who we'll announce later. Yes. So, uh, well, do we have any announcements? Yeah, uh, really quick. Uh, SteelCon? Is that still yeah, there's a SteelCon competition out there. Links are in the show notes. Larry's teaching Sense Wireless 617. That's in the show notes. The big announcement is that there will be a Cyber Monday sale at shop.securityweekly.com. However, you have to sign up for the Security Weekly Insider mailing list. And you can do that by going to securityweekly.com forward slash insider. You do that, right? Chris is getting my like, good side with this camera angle. It's very, it's very hideous. Um, and so you go to, uh, to securityweekly.com forward slash insider. Yes. Right? Insider. Yes. I N S I D E H E R. No, insider. And then on Monday, I think we'll send out. No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll send out ours, and then Monday there'll be another special announcement where you can qualify to win a phone plug. So tomorrow will be the announcement to win uh, to uh, for the forty percent off discount code for our store. Where we have, Chris, could you get, give me a couple of samples of those shirts? And remember, children, after nine years of podcasting, you can be this tightly scripted, too. Yes. It's all about improvisation, huh? Look at that. It's, it's got a guy on it, huh? Ooh, baby. Pink. It fits me. It fits very snug. And then what else? We've got, what is this? This is Smoke Naked. We've got Smoke Naked t-shirts. Yeah, watch where the ashes fall. Watch where the ashes fall. Smoke naked t-shirt. Just watch where the ashes fall. And then what is this now? Another black t-shirt. This is probably your traditional. No, this is the hack naked ladies shirt with the lady on it. This is mud flap girl. Mud flap girl. Mud flap girl. These are ladies cut shirts with the pink. And then this one's my favorite. I wore this over the weekend. Um, I was kind of hoping my son have a basketball game or something, but. Yeah, this is the black and red hack naked. We've never done this combination before, ever. Uh, we've had red, but not with the black. I like that one a lot. I like it a lot. So you can find those on, well, you can go there now and buy one, but you're going to pay full price, which is fine with me. But if you want to save 40%, securityweekly.com forward slash insider. Uh, and then uh, there'll be more discounts, uh, basically, on that mailing list. But Cyber Monday is the big one, and that notification will come <coughs> tomorrow. So, uh, and our discussions mailing list moved over to Google Groups. 
in other news. So you can sign up for that. So I haven't put a, a link up necessarily for that, but uh, actually, if you go to securityweekly.com forward slash insider, there's a link to our new discussions mailing list there. So everyone who was subscribed before got a notification. And yeah, so we're, do you want to know more about what we're doing, how we're moving DNS servers? No, we don't really want to talk about that. DNS? No, no, no. Host files forever. Just just join and we'll send you a host file. Did you ask our guest how to pronounce his last name before we started? Coggin? Okay. I did not ask. I I mean, we've met. Is that right, Paul? That's correct. Okay. Paul Coggin is a senior (laughs) principal (laughs) cybersecurity analyst in Huntsville, Alabama. Paul's responsible for architecting and securing large, complex, tactical, critical infrastructure and service provider networks. Probably knows a thing or two about DNS, um, which is kind of funny. We're having our own. Uh, I- interesting how long it takes to update. Uh, Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Paul, so how did you uh, get your start in uh, information security? I graduated college uh, in 1994. Started uh, working with Windows, Windows NT 3.1, uh, migrating VAX, VMS, and uh, old Intergraph clicks. Unix systems over to the Windows NT3 plat- NT3.1 wow. platform, and from there, <clears throat> quickly <laughs> discovered I don't want to be a sysadmin, want to be a route, one of those cool router guys. There you go. And uh, started pursuing uh, uh, network infrastructure from there. Very cool. Um, and which has turned into a security career today. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, how have changed? How have things changed from a network security perspective from way back when? Well, well, uh, we I think uh, we we more understand security when I jumped into uh, security. Most of us sysadmins, we just focused on how things work, but there's more and more uh, conversation in our culture. Uh, in in IT about security, people are more aware of the threat. They may not be as, uh, they still may not be skilled at stopping most of the threats, but at least there's a great deal of conversation about security where when I got started, there was very little conversation about security. Mm. It was just passwords, firewalls. Firewalls was not in the conversation. You know, a firewall was just a uh, router with maybe some ACLs on it. So, So things have developed a lot since since I got into the business in 94. Now, now Paul, I'm told you have a, a background in BGP. Yes. So, like, back in the day, and even to this day, people, I think, still say, well, if you take down BGP, you can take down the Internet. But, to my knowledge, this has not happened. So what is it about BGP that makes it so resilient? Or maybe it's not. Maybe you'll shed some light on, on how not resilient it is. Well, the the problem with BGP is there's an inherent trust relationship between the telco service providers and the the uh, participants in BGP. Uh, out of the box, it's not secure, so you have to build security into your configurations. In the U.S., uh, when you turn up a BGP connection, I've been working with BGP turning up telco service provider connections since uh, 1999. And my experience in the U.S., the upstream tier one providers they lock down the trust relationship with their downstream customers. If you don't own the routes, they filter what you can uh, advertise into the network yeah. so that you can you cannot accidentally introduce loops or hijack somebody's IP space accidentally. Uh, but as you, get, as you get into other parts of the world where they may have influence from organized crime or nation state type influences, uh, uh, you know, then you get into these you get into a point where uh, the trust relationship is the weakest point in the lane because someone can start a high, high advertising your IP space. Uh, you know, there's no reason they couldn't hijack your AS number as well. Uh, and they wouldn't influence all of the traffic on the Internet, but just parts of the traffic that they're closer to uh, that they have better introduced better metrics for. Uh, and so that trust relationship is the big, is the big issue. Have, Though you there's dealt, some, have you dealt with... Um, Incidents, security incidents re- revolving around BGP. I've dealt with uh, a few different instances uh, of BGP problems. Uh, nothing on the scale of what we're seeing today. 
uh, but I have seen customer routes get hijacked. Mm -hmm. On purpose or by accident or mixture? It, it, it's always an accident, isn't it? <laughs> they always claim it's an accident. Oh, I didn't mean to hijack all your routes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry it's always that. an accident. Oh, uh, what what I have seen, I have seen the routes uh, hijacked. Uh, but we, but my customers that have been hijacked, they had no no recourse. I mean, how does uh, an organization that uh, influence another organization, in another part of the world? I mean, uh, the, sec the the State Department's got bigger things on their plate than uh, worrying about some small organizations. IP prefix getting hijacked. Um, but it, it's a big problem. It's happening regularly, and uh, a lot of people are not looking at it and, and are not aware that their prefixes may be getting hijacked. Uh, so so uh, <clears throat> working uh, in, in telcos and internet service providers, what, uh, what today is some of their security concerns, and what are they doing to address those concerns? Well, at the, the tier one providers in the U.S., they are, at least where I have my experience, they, they tightly filter what's being introduced from their, um, from their customers uh, below them, the tier two, tier three providers. Um, now, one of the mitigations that's being put in place, that's being developed by the uh, Internet governance bodies, the INA, is uh, there's a capability called resource public key infrastructure that if all the if all the telcos uh, implemented it, you'd have basically a PKI infrastructure to authenticate and verify that people actually own their routes that they're trying to advertise. But that is going to take a long time to get that rolled out. It's going to be like IPv6 trying to get rolled out. Uh, yeah, it's a great I it's a great idea. We we may eventually get there, but it's not going to be tomorrow. Mm. Uh, uh, so the uh, R the R PKI is uh, is one means that's being uh, Implemented. I have not seen any of my customers move toward it yet, or been, or have they been asked uh, by their tier one providers to implement it yet? Uh, so, but but you know, it's a it's a solution. Uh, the the biggest thing I'm recommending to customers, really specifically enterprise organizations, whether they have a BGP connection or not, because somebody's advertising their routes in BGP, is to start proactively monitoring your IP prefixes. Using a service, a BGP Mon or Renesis, uh, or Team Cymru, or roll your own solution with looking, you know, script up something on the Looking Glass servers, and start proactively monitoring for uh, hijacking, <clears throat> so that you know that something's happening to your traffic, uh, instead of waiting for Brian Krebs to uh, <laughs> to write an article about it. Right. Yeah, yeah and that's uh, it is interesting because it. It's any of the anything that hijacks your traffic. If I think I've gone to your website and something bad happens to me, I'm blaming you. Uh, right. And as the average user, the difference between uh, you know it's uh, Comcast or whoever sent me there when I typed in whatever I typed in, uh, that nuance doesn't matter when uh, I'm canceling <laughs> credit cards or worse. Right. Right. So, so I, I think also, uh, Jack, that, you know, everyone, you know, cyber intel is such a, a hot topic these days. It's, you know, it's, it's a, especially on Twitter, it's, you know, it's a lot of conversations about intel. I think a good source of intel, if I was one of these large enterprise organizations that's trying to proactively uh, see what's happening out in the wild, is to start not only monitoring my IP prefixes out Using BGP Mon or like I said, look you know, roll your own tool up uh, on the Looking Glass servers, uh, but monitor your peers and your partners, your suppliers, to see what's happening with their IP space. Because it might be that you could get some intel to see if if you're about to be targeted because somebody in your supply chain, one of your business partners, uh, maybe it's one of your competitors is being targeted. If they're being hit you very well may be next because it's happening. It's happening all the time. I just saw, I just saw something, uh, I retweeted, uh, something I saw where BGP mom was showing that someone out of the middle East started, started advertising some IP prefixes for L3 communications, uh, uh, uh just this week. Yeah, it's happening all the time. Yeah. That's, that's important to, to point out. It's, it's, 
these BV BGP advertisements, every now and then we'd get a, a mistaken one uh, right. in years past. And it's like uh, some of the early possibilities with IPv6 and other emerging technologies, even though it's been emerging for a long time. Uh, these aren't theoretical anymore. This is actually happening. This is for oh. real now. Yeah. Uh, did, did one, you know, did, there was the good big hijack the other day uh, in Canada where the insider, you know, there's no insider threat, of course, but someone on the inside of a telco, my understanding in Canada, uh, hijacked uh, over, was it a dozen or more uh, telco prefixes to high, to steal bitcoins? Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that, that was, was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, but there's no insider threat, of course. Well, you know, uh, it's it depends on how you define it and what the loss is. Um, but insider right. threat, by without additional definitions, means just as much as threat intelligence, right? Right. <laughs> Drink. Oh wait, my glass right. is empty. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, so so Paul, um, this is Joff, and by the way, Paul Asadorian, you should introduce me. So this is I Joff. You know, I didn't introduce anyone. <clears throat> I was I was so excited about T-shirts. I apologize, Joff. Hi. Yeah. Hey, it's Hi, John how are you? Uh So, uh, yes, welcome to uh, Tuesday night, which is really unusual. So Paul's like really thrown off because, you know, it's just not a normal night for him. Um, but uh, Paul Coggan, question for you. Do you see with your with your tier one or tier twos, uh, the customers that you're dealing with, as much as you can say anyway, um, I, is there any interest in looking at source addressing information from the perspective of any form of filtering, it, whether it be ACL based or um, – Unicast reverse path forwarding checks, um, you know, particularly um, as it as it pertains to uh, things like RFC nineteen eighteen, as especially. When with my customers, when I implement the networks, we're we're looking at uh, anti spoofing measures. We're locking down that control plane and uh, data plane management plane to prevent anyone from trying to say spoof traffic headed into the network. Uh, right. that someone, someone's trying to exploit the management plane, trying to get an SSH session, or trying to, uh, you, you know, uh, look for SNMP resources, looking for an open res SNMP access on the management plane. All, we will, we will implement uh, anti-spoofing measures and uh, and lock down that those, like I said, the control plane, management plane, and data plane, uh, and of course, I have to believe that the tier ones are are uh, all over there, at least in the U.S. They're very well trained. Uh, all of the engineers that I've worked with uh, are very, are seem, appear to be very strong in the, in addressing that. I don't know what they're doing in other parts of the world. So, so my US. understanding of just to enlighten our listeners a little bit, and and please correct me if I'm wrong, Paul uh, Coggan, um, it, with unicast reverse path forwarding checks in, specifically, um, the implementation checks the source address of the packet and uh, looks to see if it's in the routing information base, and if it's not, it will reject mm -hmm. that, that packet coming in uh, to, to the device. Um, is there right. any traction, um, first of all, correct me if I'm wrong on that, and, and secondly, is there any traction in some of these Tier 1 and Tier 2 providers in the unicast reverse path forwarding check space? I don't know what the Tier 1s are doing. I've only, I typically deal with the uh, more of the Tier 3s, the end I deal with mostly uh, rural independent phone companies, mm -hmm. service providers out in rural America, and I know that we're we're uh, implementing those controls and checks and balances. I'm not I do not deal with the tier ones, but I have to assume that they have pretty rigorous engineering uh, at their level. If we're doing it out at the spokes, uh, at the spoke level out in rural America. Uh, yeah, I, that's, I that's, that's that. good. That's good to hear. Um, I, I understand. Uh, I was uh, a, a network um, architect at a spoke at, at some point in a large university space, so we, we were BGP enabled. But um, and we did all those sorts of things. I've always been curious to see whether the the tier ones are doing it. I got the sense in some of the consulting I was doing with with uh, um, uh, some tier two providers that I was engaged with that um, there's some resistance to to unicast reverse path forwarding checks, p particularly because of the complexity of their networks. And uh, it takes a, a lot of rigorous engineering to get there. But I, I, like you, I would have to assume that there is rigorous engineering at the tier ones because there has to be. Um, That's right. Yeah. That's right. They have very rigorous, large staffs of engineers that have very strict configuration control. 
uh, my perception anyway when I deal with the when I deal with them when I'm bringing up new circuits uh, for my customers. That's my that's the presumption I have. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, without giving names of uh, organizations I've worked with, I've been I've always been impressed with their uh, the control that they at least make me perceive that they have. Yeah. Uh, do do you rec- uh, do you recommend other controls such as uh, uh, you know TTL checks and, and and peer authentication? I have to assume that you probably do. Um, right. And do you go even further than that? Can you describe any of the the direct peering controls that you recommend? Well, you're going to want to go and, like you said, authenticate your upstream peers and, and depending on who you're peering with, filter what they're advertising to you. The, the biggest thing, uh, what's, hitting, what's hitting the customers is if it matters to you, if confidentiality and integrity matter to you, you better be encrypting it because there's no telling what's happening to that traffic upstream and who's looking at it. And once it leaves that network, it doesn't matter uh, about that peering point the security in those first hops between the telcos. What matters is in the greater macro scale when it comes to the BGP, what's happening at that macro level is those trust relationships get traversed. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, really pushing for people to, to add more encryption. And the big concern I have with this whole BGP hijacking, Jack, I'm, I'm real curious if you've thought about this, with all the BGP hijacking and the trust relationships, and uh, Joff, since you uh, have a telco background, I'd be really interested if you thought about this as well. Uh, the routers I put in, you know, the BFRs, the big freaking routers, big as a door frame, uh, most of those routers are not only running BGP, they're also being used for Metro Ethernet services, private MPLS, VPN services. Uh, you know they're they're running numerous services to provide public infrastructure type services like voice, video, cable, TV, internet, uh, numerous services over one router where it's being virtualized. In addition to providing the uh, BGP that many of us are familiar with, and I'm I'm just I can't help but think about the criminal mindset. And why would I would I why would I just limit myself to hijacking BGP prefixes if I have access to the routers? And all of the MPLS circuits, VPNs that are true. You know, you just raised a great point, Paul, because um, there's a feature which um, a lot of folks are not aware of. In the MPLS world, particularly, um, there's an ability to leak routes between virtual route forwarding instances um, quite easily um, with, with a fairly simple configuration. And if you were to hijack that router, uh, and you were dealing with a uh, a private uh, branch office scenario where they were treating that that provider <laughs> a, a, as a confidential transport for their traffic. It would be fairly trivial to leak that organization's routes to another virtual route forwarding instance and expose that organization to direct attack. Paul, That's wasn't exactly that the, the subject of your talk at Takedown Con this year? Yes. Yes, I just spoke about it at... Uh, in Austria, at besides Vienna, mm-hmm. this past week, I uh, spoke on, spoke on the subject as well. Um, yes. Yeah, so, Paul, I think I, your your emphasis on encryption, especially uh, for those using MPLS circuits uh, in the in the sort of private branch office space, is absolutely dead on. They, you know, these organizations really must not trust uh, that that circuit provisioning, even even oh. with the best of providers. Oh, but they promised me. It's it's like my own. It's just it's extending like my, my network. network. It's right. just MPLS is just extending your network. It's just like the that's cloud. What the, it is the cloud. Well, that's what the lying cloud. dirtbag sales weasel promised me for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, um, right. trust us. Trust us. We're an ISP. We've never done it. Oh wait, <laughs> damn it. Right, <laughs> right. And, and that's exactly right. It, it's it's absolutely as secure as uh, the cust- as the customer networks I go into, and they're secure because they have VLAN segmentation. You know, yeah. yeah right. we, we've never heard <laughs> yeah. of a VLAN hopping attack, have right. we? Well, the thing is, <laughs> right? Well, so VLAN hopping in a modern, fully up to date, and properly configured environment is really not a problem, right? And if if we ever come across a modern, up-to-date uh, environment, it won't be a problem. That's right. And uh, 
<laughs> well, I, I think the big the big problem that uh, Joff that the enterprise customers have is they believe that that VPN marketing nom- nomenclature associated with MPLS VPN now mm. is equated to encryption. Where we we've kind of lost some. It's one of those lang- parts of our language that we've lost in the IT community. VPN's been hijacked now. It automatically implies encryption when uh, all of us. It's been around for a while. You know, remember when GRE and X.25 and ATM and Frame Relay PVCs were uh, mm. VPNs? Then there was no encryption. It was just a uh, private circuit, just like a, uh, a, a a virtual circuit, just like a v- And everyone's assuming that it's encrypted, and uh, and it's absolutely okay. not. And I, I've that, I've had that's, some- that's an excellent follow-on point, uh, Paul, because. Um, you know, just for everybody, again, I'll, I'll do a little education here, just, just for everybody's uh, edification and amusement here. A VPN from an MPLS provider perspective is just a virtual circuit for a network. There is no encryption uh, in, in an MPLS provider's VPN. Uh, it is simply packets that are tagged literally with an integer number as they traverse the MPLS uh, uh, backbone. So th- there is absolutely no encryption unless you do it yourself. That's right. Right, right, and it's it's worth pointing out that <laughs> not all encryption is good encryption, too. Mm-hmm. As long as we're talking about this and, and you know, just being overly optimistic, um, <laughs> if they say it's encrypted, who, who controls the keys uh, and uh, is it encrypted <clears throat> well? Oh, it's secure because we wrote this thing ourselves and uh, we uh, manage the keys. It's well, it uses, two it strikes. uses SSL, so it must <laughs> be secure. It uses SSL. So, 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 Jack, you hit exactly where I was about to pivot to, is the second point to the problem, Joff, going back to that trust relationship, is the telco service provider is going to drop in typically a managed router service. And I think that's great. You know, they give you that lots out, uh, CPE managed network. And then if you uh, listen to this podcast and you start getting paranoid and want to add encryption, they're going to offer to add encryption to that router. But we still go back to that same problem. What if the telco gets hacked or what if the telco engineer gets goes bad? Now you still got that trust relationship. It doesn't matter if your traffic is encrypted. You've still been popped by, via that, that uh, trust relationship. So a big thing that I'm encouraging uh, the customers to think about is put their own, put a separately managed VPN behind that telco provided CPE device, uh, and if they don't want to manage it, they need to get a a second independent third party to manage it for them, uh, so that there's some separation of roles and responsibilities. Uh, now, of course, a service provider that wants all your business and lock you <laughs> into their service doesn't want to hear something like that. But it's all about mitig- you know managing your risk, but. But the, uh, the great thing is that um, as we move to software-defined networking, all these problems go away. Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. That's what the data Because we say. can't automate the same mistakes that we're, right? I mean, we, we'll certainly um, solve these problems, and it won't be even easier to attack a computer that's a management plane and automate hijacking routes, right? Please? Please. Yeah, we're move that's right. I, I, I personally see software defined network as the network apocalypse. Personally, <laughs> as an as a as a guy as an old router guy, leave my, don't leave my router alone. <laughs> I think Chris Chris had a question. So the latest version of ASA iOS nine point two X supports BGP, which is good for small businesses, I think, because if they already have an ASA, they can just load that in there and have their networking guy or MSS, MSSP manage it for them. Yeah, because you can trust all MSSPs. Mm. And, and so what was the question, Chris? No question, just a comment. Uh, uh, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's very interesting. Uh, I could see where you would, uh, where you could use that to, uh, as, uh, to integrate with an MPLS network. Yeah, you could see you could see uh, ASAs directly peered with a CE device in the MPLS right. space, right. Uh, but aren't those relationships, Paul, um, in the routing world? Don't they typically just uh, a gateway of last resort kind of routes? There's no active. I, I, at least I've not seen any real active route table exchange in these these uh, branch office kind of private peering relationships. 
If they're a small spoke, but I have a customer with an international presence, and uh, they're running EBGP to from their uh, customer prem to the uh, telco for, so, for so the uh, BG, for the for the MPLS VPN. So I think it does come back to what you were saying that for customers for their best security interest would be well advised to uh, encrypt uh, on on a border device that is one in from that CPE device so that it's within their control. Um, they can they can uh, manage that that uh, key management relationship across their organization um, independently of the uh, the telco and 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 just you know. If they screw it up, it's it's their own fault, basically. <laughs> That's right, and we, and I think we have a perception because back when I know when I was an enterprise network engineer, we just drew that magic cloud in our Visio drawings and took for granted and didn't <laughs> yeah. ask. We didn't ask those hard questions of the sales guy because we didn't know what we didn't know because we weren't hey, trained in. Uh, Hey Paul, that magic cloud has massively migrated up the OSI <laughs> stack. <laughs> oh, it has. It has. Uh, yes, I was the layer one, layer two, layer three cloud. Uh, yeah, it's now jacked now up in the, layer uh, nine. Yeah, yeah zero <laughs> through to nine. A theater soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the cloud is totally. It's the apocalypse, man. <laughs> it's the network apocalypse. But it it uh, sounds like, but it sounds like cloud. We're talking about potentially three different things. I mean, there's cloud applications like salesforce.com. There's cloud hosting where you can put your servers and then there's cloud networking, um, right. which is what we're talking about now. Right. From a, a risk perspective and a potential solution to some of those security problems, which is the kind of the easiest and what are some of the issues that would relate across all three if I had to pr start prioritizing my risk? Well, what I work on is uh, the layers one through three, four, and if you need it, like I, like I said, if you need it confidential, if you need uh, to ensure the integrity, you've got you've got to lock down the encryption. You can't assume that the uh, the WAN cloud that my experience is primarily in, or whether you're dealing with one of these application providers, you can't you cannot assume that they've done everything right. Uh, Despite what the marketing slick says, you've you've got you've got to go and put in your own due diligence and look at the trust relationships across the. Well, like Joff said, it's the OSI model. You've got to go through each layer of the OSI model, depending on the provider you're dealing with, what service you're buying in the cloud, uh, and secure it. Uh, you you got to take responsibility for that and just not transfer your risk to the cloud and hope that hope that they've done their job because I work in that cloud and. Uh, it's not as we all hope it is. Mm. They have the same problems, same politics, same budget, same lack of understanding as any other enterprise organization is struggling with. Um, it, and uh, you know some of the, some of the things that what I was uh, what I see with the WAN cloud since I've been working in it for a while, both from an enterprise and as an engineer building these networks, they're just as easy to target like an enterprise network. Just as just as easy, they make the same mistakes. They have those uh, open network trust relationships for that management plane. Uh, one of the one of the things that I talk about is how I got my eyes opened when a lar a, a, an extremely large organization left left uh, you know sixty seventy eighty routers in place around the country for a, a particular customer. And uh, you know, if you ever logged into a router, you know what's in that router. They left. They left them in place. They didn't. After the contract was over, we took over and migrated this customer to a whole new telco uh, network infrastructure. They left all those routers in place with all the configs, all the trust relationships for their radius servers, all the uh, username, passwords, SNMP routing policies, everything left in place, so that if an aggressor got a hold of them, they had everything to go and develop an attack tree and uh, combine that with a phishing attack and you're off to the races on, on and possibly owning some infrastructure because you know they only have so many network management systems and there's only so many radio servers and you got the IP addresses for them you got a good target list once you get that initial access and so when I go and read the trade rags uh, read you know read things out on Twitter somebody gets popped 
It just doesn't surprise me what's happening there. And that's how someone's going to take over uh, a telco. And I've actually personally, uh, Jack, I was at a conference that you and I both were at uh, this past year. I won't say where. Um, but I had someone come up and talk to me when I was throwing out this concept, this idea about the MPLS stuff. And they came up and told me that uh, that they had a uh, that they actually called someone leaking routes from their MPLS VPN, their private wide area network. Out, they called it called the traffic traversing out their uh, internet border. It's very enlightening. Oh, uh, so, so this is not speculation. Be, this is real. It was supposed to it's be a, a private connection, but they were accidentally routing those across the internet. Yeah, it was all accidental. It was all, some something out of the MPLS private VPN mm -hmm. network. Some, what it appears to have happened is someone has joined that private MPLS VPN, as Joff said. They they uh, leaked routes very easily. Just a couple commands leaked routes into a private network, and it also and it just so happened to come from a interesting nation somewhere else in the world. We'll just say that. And uh, those routes were made to be of a higher priority. Did I term that right? It's been a while since I've done networking. No, no, they were they were not a priority. They were just le they were joined the network like they were a part of the VPN, yeah, I got you. and then they traversed from that private wide area network. Just like a spoke site, just like a remote spoke, that, mm -hmm. and traversed out the uh, headquarters internet firewall, uh, and, and uh, so no telling how long it had been there, hmm. who uh, who what other networks might have been compromised besides theirs, and being influenced. Uh, but nobody's talking about this because few people, few network people, are looking at what's coming in from these metro Ethernet connections and these MPLS circuits. Uh, you know, there's that trust relationship, mm -hmm. and uh, and we're not we're not monitoring the uh, router traffic. We're not looking at the traffic that's being injected from these uh, private network connections. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a and, big and all it all it takes, uh, Paul um, Acidorian Paul. I'll have to call you Paul A <laughs> and uh, Paul mm -hmm. Paul C. All all it takes is um, a longer prefix or a lower metric, right? I mean, that, in that right. route. That route becomes preferred. That's right. Um, One of the scary things here, it, uh, it goes back to your point about people not watching this, but when you find something like this, um, I think with the potential for misconfiguration and the potential for uh, just plain screwing up, um, I wonder how many people have found errors um, and just assumed it was an error. Uh, and just corrected it and moved on with just life fix it and move yeah. it on yeah. without uh, without triggering um, without triggering uh, investigation because uh, what do you you know if you have if you have a server popped then you're going to roll into your your forensics and incident response process right right please right everybody has a mature one of those and that's how you handle a what a oh. server or yeah. works to major workstation compromise the D dfir team is activated or whether they're internal or externally right because we do that oh, well screw it so pretend we do that normally <laughs> with real computers i'm sure that that happens um pretty much never with oddities in the networking space particularly those routers when ah oh, we it's just the guy from the isp must have made a mistake no, they tend to right. get assumed away, I think. Yep. But um, that's uh, my assumption. I, I don't know, but I, I would be really surprised if actual, um, you know, f response uh, behavior is formalized in this sort of network problem. And the problem with not doing it, even if it turned out just to be a mistake, is that um, that means that you don't learn from that and institutionalize the changes required to keep it from happening again. So, so Paul C., do you see organizations uh, performing a statistical baseline on their multiple route tables and actually performing trend analysis uh, on that data over time? Very few. Very few are, uh, are doing that. The ones that I know that are, the telco, some, a lot of, some of my telco service provider customers, now they're doing it. Uh, they're they're doing it. They're they're implementing NetFlow and uh, baselining, but on the enterprise side, it's uh, not a great deal of them doing that yet. The, typically, the ones that are starting to do it, they're they will uh, after they've been compromised by someone very sophisticated, 
if they have a good incident response team come in that's skilled and understands uh, networking, they will be advised to implement that, and then they, they'll start learning it. But I find that uh, the network infrastructure instrumentation is ignored, uh, and uh, that's the reason I go try to make it a point to go talk about it at the different cons is to help people get, you know, let's go get some visualization out of this network. You have, like you mentioned, you got things like NetFlow that we can be uh, baselining. You know, what is normal and uh, what is abnormal? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big, I mean, I'm a you know, and then there's so many other things like, you know, I was talking about earlier, like, you, you know, the Unicast reverse path forwarding checks. That's, that's um, right. One of the things I used to do in an environment is, is null route the dark space. I mean, just do a short prefix route. Uh, for for the address space of the organization I'm um, concerned and, and route it to null so that if there's not a longer prefix route in the table then that traffic just goes in the bit bucket you know stuff like that uh, people don't think about um, and and they ought to be thinking about um, you know another example of that and, and I've done this in an organization is is um, not null route it but take the longer pre uh, sorry the shorter prefix and route it to something like a uh, a top hit or something that can analyze the traffic coming at it so that any non um, route table uh, entities that are active out there will, will go to a place where people can look at it, you know, and actually do and perhaps do something about it. Um, I do have a f another follow-on question for you, but I'll let you comment on that first. Yeah, when uh, most of the B the BGP engineers I know are filtering that dark space, they're looking for it, but. But what I'm seeing, you know, everybody's looking for the RFC 1918 addresses. But there's a lot of IP space that's, that is, you know, routable IPs uh, that have not been allocated, that are not, or should I say they're not being utilized, that are starting to be uh, put in place by the spammers, uh, the botnet, botnet guys also adding to that darknet space. So they're, they're turning that darknet into a moving target in some cases because there might be – that some of the address space is owned by some uh, some government or other organization that just hasn't utilized it. Uh, yeah. It's not, you know, uh, there's lots of IP space out there that you could introduce into these networks. Uh, yeah, that that's an it, interesting it, thought, right? Just just because there's public announcements out there that all of IPv4 is full and used, the reality is completely not the case. There is lots of IP space floating around that is allocated to regional providers that is completely unused. It's just full from the uh, the top tier uh, allocating uh, um, regional entities. And so yeah, that's, a, that's, that's also a good point. Okay, so here's a follow-on question for you. It seems like I'm on a roll tonight. Um, go Joff, go. Go Joff, go. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, with regard to virtualization and hypervisors and the trend towards migrating, switching, and routing and security into software in hypervisors, can you comment on that from a security perspective or, and or a routing switching perspective as to what your thoughts are with, with regard to that in, in both a technical and organizational political kind of perspective? I prefer to have routing and switching performed in ASICs. I'm not a fan of uh, moving it to a server. Maybe that's because I'm a router guy. Uh, but I, I, I do not want my network to be uh, take my network infrastructure taken out of place because someone hacks the hypervisor and takes out not only the net, the server but also the uh, network infrastructure. That's going to be a really bad freaking day. When that happens, I, I personally uh, am not a fan of that, uh, and I know everybody's wanting to virtualize it and run, it, run everything in software, uh, but I prefer to keep the routing and switching in ASICs with, uh, with separate control of that management plane and uh, control plane, separation of services, uh, so that it can be more easily secured. Is that, you know, if you open up, if you got that hypervisor and it gets popped, you, you've lost everything. That's, that's just my personal opinion. That's, in principle, I agree with you, but with the management planes being offloaded to untrustworthy systems in many cases, even if the, the uh, boxes are locked down ASICs uh, or other things with res restricted and uh, you know, reduced instruction sets, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we've ever done a really good job of securing management planes but uh, the idea mm -hmm. that the box itself is 
uh, is flinging packets, and that's all it knows how to do. Has some uh, some charms. So, so one of the things that's point. bothered me in the path, past uh, with the increase in the hypervisor activity is um, f- from a security perspective, the loss of visibility of traffic, right? If you look at the cloud world in the tremendous amount of server infrastructure that's, that's in these, these hypervisors, um, there's an increasing trend towards traffic not transiting uh, intra device and just staying within the 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 frame of the 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 large hypervisor um, you know provider of of uh, or vendor of choice right um, and so I often see people in the network security ops space really get kind of freaked out about that and and start asking like hey can you send me NetFlow can you send me stuff you know at least in more sophisticated space uh, what's your thoughts on that Paul C right. I won't. I won't complete visualization and instrumentation and on the traffic flows. And I want it independent, so I can trust it and know that it's not being influenced. And if that hypervisor gets popped, how do I know that what I'm that the flow statistics, that baseline that you referenced earlier, how do I know that I'm not getting spoofed and fed bad data? I like to have that separate uh, data plane and uh, control plane. And, and you're exactly right, uh, Jack. Even though uh, existing hardware, the, the, the legacy, you might call it, uh, infrastructure has that separate management plane, in most cases we have not done a good job of isolating. And the management plane is dropped right into a common VLAN with all the enterprise traffic so that if you can find it, you can brute force it with it, you know, do a dictionary SNMP attack or SSH brute force against it. Uh, we have done a very sloppy job, but if someone... Uh, gets motivated to go and separate those services out and do due diligence, it's going to be easier to secure it uh, once uh, security is adopted into the culture there. Uh, Some of what you just said about understanding the basics um, made me think of something from this weekend. So I was doing some yard work, uh, came in and grabbed a beer and did some channel surfing and uh, saw one really horrible thing and then saw something that was really insightful. The horrible thing was someone who wasn't Patsy Cline singing crazy, which should be illegal unless you're Willie Nelson who wrote it. Uh, but the other thing, uh, Herbie Hancock, what? That's <laughs> awesome. <So random. laughs> Herbie Hancock was talking about his new book. And at one point, uh, the interviewer asked about um, the ease of accessing music and electronic creativity. And Hancock talked about, you know, asked about having to do it, the, you know, reel to reel in the hard way. And his observation about mastering music and electronic music and using electronic tools was that he had learned the hard way bit by bit, learned all of the fundamentals, and then had to unlearn them to use some of the new technologies. But the perspective is that if you understand those, and, I, I, you know, so. You have to learn the fundamentals of, of the, in this case, networking. And then as we migrate into a software-defined environment, we have to unlearn some of the things that we take for granted as old packet monkeys. But when something goes wrong in these advanced environments, um, or you need to know what, what you can push and what's going to break, I think there's a real correlation. And having it come from a musician... It really like, hey, that kind of reminds me of a bunch of other stuff. You have to learn the fundamentals, have a thorough grasp of it to really understand it, and then you have to unlearn it, right? It's it's You want a performance tune your car, you need to understand points because then the rest of the electronic ignition makes sense. Understand the carburetor. And then we throw it all away and unlearn that stuff. Uh, but then when you're sitting there and uh, the packets aren't flowing right, if you don't think about you know, back down to this, um, where is it going? What routes are being advertised? Uh, what <laughs> trace, trace route? Oh yeah. Trace route. Let's, where'd the packet go? Um, anyway, just thinking about what you're talking about, but the understanding the fundamentals. And so people that are That's coming in, point. people that are coming in that are highly mm-hmm. effective because they've learned all, you know, they've just m- launched into a mastery of the new technologies are, uh, they'll run circles around me trying to get like their, virtual or cloud infrastructure talking to each other uh, until it breaks. Uh, but anyway. Jack, did you really just want to say those young whippersnappers and just like get it done there? No, I'm no. Just... I, I... 
I'm just get off my black my back plane. Yeah, um. get off my back plane. <laughs> but, but you know, Jack, you're you're you got a really good point. You know, I'm not some uh, elite hacker. I'm not. A, I am in no means uh, in the world. You know, the scale of a Dave Kennedy or someone like that, or Raphael Mudge. But but because these these new the new people in the business and a lot of the people that's been around a while, they forget those fundamental building blocks, simple like the OSI model that we kept going back to tonight, uh, taking it apart layer by layer. How does it, what is the integration and the trust relationships and that interoperability across all those layers? How does it work at each layer? And, and then how do you secure it? And then if it gets broke, how do you go and do forensics at each layer? And when things go bad, you, if you don't understand that, you're going to miss something. And, and like now with all the cloud-based stuff, everybody's you know worried about layer seven. Uh, well, what, how are you going to deal with those lower layers when you don't when you don't have that fundamental understanding? Because they didn't go anywhere; it's all still there. And uh, and that's and that's what I focus on is those lower is that that lack of understanding of all those layers. Uh, just, all you got to do is find one layer that that they don't understand and then pop it. I think there's a natural tendency in the information security industry to focus on the application layer and kind of work your way down because, honestly, a large number, a great proportion of the vulnerabilities are introduced at, at, by, by developers at the application layer. And a lot of the lower layers of the OSI model have been um, beaten to death, honestly, um, and you know, are not perfect, but are um, tried and true, I guess would be the, the, the phrase I want to put. Um, they certainly need to be secured, but it's a very different animal um, than than this this fast evolving layer seven space where vulnerabilities are just a dime a dozen coming out, you know, every second. <laughs> yeah, you know, but how many networks can you plug into and and you can art poison them in less time than it takes to boot the laptop and how long has art been out there and we still haven't secured layer two how I many no, I mean, no, no true I, very very valid point I, uh, um, if, if, if we're going to get into this sort of level of depression does it do, I need another drink <laughs> well, well now I'm thinking about uh, needing a nut driver to open any telco box on the side of any street in America well, and plugging in your laptop so you can access the traffic light yes. controller? Yes. <laughs> so they do use Torx security bits. Well, yes, they have moved to Torx bits or now. Or the super high security wafer lock that you might find as well. I, I've it's, yet it's to see thin. one. Of, <laughs> I've, I've yet to see one. Um, and, yeah, never mind. I, I, it's, 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 it's getting into so I, I guess where I'm going is, you know, wherever, you know, all the cool kids are virtualizing, putting everything in a Hyper-V, but that Layer 2 didn't go anywhere, and all – and we – what, how many years is, is Ethernet and ARP been out there? We haven't fixed it, and we're moving it into software. And it's all of those protocol problems are still going to be there. And we're going to have to deal with them. And just moving them up to software and uh, turning it into a setup.exe is not making all of those other layers of the OSI model go away. But it's... Yeah. The same thing that the virtualization offers in, in traditional computing uh, workloads um, as does cloud. Cloud, you know, we have the ability to uh, replicate uh, the things we do right um, faster than ever before, and with that comes the ability to replicate errors um, faster than ever ever before. And uh, we add the the additional piece of hiding the traffic from us. Um, you know, when when you're trying to sort out when you're trying to sort out uh, traffic, especially once you get to something like uh, VMware NSX. There's no place to put the tap, and even if you manage to sniff the traffic because of the way they're tagging that traffic, you're not going to have any idea what's going on. So um, we're going to have the ability to, um, like I said, we're gonna do th the things we do right, we can do faster and more efficiently than ever before. And the things we do wrong, we can also do faster and more efficiently than ever before. And bugs can be replicated uh, across our infrastructure faster than ever before. You know, I really appreciate you bringing up TAP. So that brings up and goes back to a really good point. I, I'm a hardcore network guy, and as much as uh, 
I think of my understanding of separation of services. I know that I can screw up and anybody else can screw up with their configuration. Anything can be owned. And if you're depending for your visualization instrumentation uh, it, to get to get your baseline statistics and things like uh, Joff brought up earlier, the only thing that you can really trust is those taps. Because if that, because you, like you mentioned, if that management plane is dropped out in the enterprise network, it's not secured. Even though you have a separate management plane, it gets popped. The bad guy can influence your visibility, but they're not going to influence that tap. And how? And if you want true incident handling, you want true visualization instrumentation that you can baseline and trust. A tap is the way to go. How do we? How are you going to get a hardware tap in that hyper environment? Uh, if you're after true, hard, true, trusted forensics, network forensics. Well, what, what I think happens there is at some level you have to trust the virtualized network. And if you really don't, um, you've got to route that traffic out and back in to the virtualized environment. And that's where you hang your tap. And it, it is interesting. Uh, I was recently at an event where um, it was an all NDA event. However... This, this issue of people, including folks who spend a lot of time working with the, with the Amazon and Azure and uh, uh, local virtualization, uh, when the topic of taps came up and, you know, who still carried what hardware, uh, most of us still had something like one of the little dual-com USB-powered repeaters or some similar device that fit in a backpack that, if not... Uh, in the backpack every day was uh, readily at hand for any time something weird happened or we were, you know, just setting up, just setting up an environment in case we needed to, to suck that traffic off. Do you have jumper cables with you too? I do not. I think Jack just said out loud he wanted to suck that traffic off or something like that. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> really like that <laughs> traffic, Jack. That's, that's siphon. Yeah, whatever. Yes, but it, it's... Um, yeah, where do you Sorry, trust? Sorry, class, get up. <laughs> I think I need a drink. Um. You know, it goes further than that. Actually, I, I, I was uh, w when I was in the big enterprise space. I actually considered um, in some of the instrumentation not only tapping, and this was at fiber optic level, but also having the devices that were were doing full packet capture um, and or instrumentation of the traffic that was flowing through actually snipping the transmit to those guys so that they could only receive data and console access was the only thing you had to those instrumentation devices. Uh, I mean, that's hardcore, but, you know, I mean, you know, if you really want to trust what's going on and you don't want any remote access to that instr instrumentation, then you got to make it that way. That's exactly right. That's what I, that's what I try to teach my students is to, uh, is to, to make it where it's one, one way do it with optics or with your Cat Five cable. Uh, make it, make a one way diode basically, or buy a one way diode from somebody like Waterfall, uh, and make it to where that traffic is is streaming streaming into a protected enclave, and it's not coming out. Uh, but Until like somebody you, screws up. <laughs> and like you like you like you, I'm paranoid. Uh, I, I won't feel. I won't, I won't. I want the traffic to go in, and there's no way for a two-way connection. Is that? Uh, um, are there SCADA ICS applications to that, Paul? That you were referencing? Yes, you could do that. You could use that in a uh, SCADA world, but most of them don't. Uh, typically, what you see in a SCADA environment, the SCADA server is sitting on the enterprise network. Uh, and I'm not joking. Uh, and in lots of cases, it's going to be it will be exposed to the internet where you can RDP or VNC or web right to it. You know, we be, be it far from us to be inconvenienced. Uh, well, you're but, talking about the, the HMI, right? Yes, yes. Uh, where you can hit it. The uh, but, the but at least they all use two-factor authentication. You need a username and a password. <laughs> 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 I, 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 Jack, you you would you would hope that, but I actually saw a case where a yeah. customer showed me that they could flip out their phone and I, without I, putting I a password into the phone and and just click on VNC, log straight into their SCADA remotely it's, over the internet. So much faster! It's, 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 it was secure it's, too because I tried to offer 
free consulting to clean up the network, and I was told that they thought that was secure. And please fix the problem I was hired to do and uh, mm. and leave. Quit talking about quickly. security and get back to fixing transport problems. Uh, yeah, leave quickly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> run, yes. But run we're, screaming but we're, away. But yeah. where you you'll see the one way diode like the waterfall in uh, places that are under NERC for compliance. They'll put those in. I'm a big believer in them. I, you've got to, you should, we've got to greatly protect the, that uh, SCADA stuff, Paul. Uh, it's very rarely done, well, at least, we, we at least out know. in, uh, at least with the guys that are not under compliance. Let me say, if they're not under regulatory compliance, where there's a heart, where there's a hammer requiring them to do such, it is not the case. Mm. Though it is a good architecture implementation, and I strongly recommend it. I know, Paul, uh, we, didn't, we didn't get to talk much about SCADA. Unfortunately, we're running short on time here. Um, maybe we'll have to have you back on to talk about SCADA in ICS. How's that? That'd be great. All righty. So, Paul, you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Sure. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, persistent, uh, relentless, uh, strong. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? <laughs> uh, probably my deer rifle. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, a a uh, high-tech redneck's journey. Okay, and remind me not to go hunting with you. In the popular <laughs> game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? <laughs> Uh, I have not, I'd have to think about that one. It's a popular game in Europe. Uh, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Uh, Clint Eastwood and uh, uh, Farrah Fawcett. Excellent, excellent. Paul, thank you very much for coming on Security Weekly. And I'm just kidding. We can go hunting anytime, dude. Next time I'm, I'm in your neck of the woods. Yeah, you, can, you get to Alabama, let me know. We'll go. Absolutely. It sounds, uh, sounds awesome. Thanks for coming on the show, Paul. And uh, we'll definitely have you back on. And uh, we'll finish our conversation about uh, SCADA and ICS. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, appreciate Paul. you inviting me. Thank you. Talk it was a lot later. of fun. <laughs> With that, we're going to take Paul. a short break, come back, and talk about our stories for this week. So stay talk. tuned. Don't go anywhere. Yeah.